In 1940s, two individuals made a decision to whether they were going to follow Christ or whether they were going to choose not to believe in God. One person, they were very, very good friends, started in the ministry together, goes up on a mountain and decides, you know, am I going to really, truly trust in God here? My friend, his name's Charles Templeton, has told me that he can't have faith any longer. Started out in ministry, was a preacher, brought people to Christ, preached God's word, and came across a photo in the 1940s of a young man starving in Africa, a child who couldn't be fed, and said, you know, how could a loving God allow such an action to take place? In his mind and his logical thinking, decided, I can't trust God any longer. And began a life of preaching against the Bible and believing and becoming an atheist. His friend on that mountain made the decision, despite anything that I see, despite anything that people tell me, the one thing that I can choose to have is faith. And that was Billy Graham, who continued on to be one of the best preachers that we continue to celebrate today, who brought thousands and hundreds of thousands to Christ. Two individuals, the same message, two people, two different perspectives. One decided to walk away from ministry, one decided to preach the ministry. Here in the book of Revelations, we see Jesus speaking to his church, writing through the disciple John on the island of Patmos. And John has suffered some horrific events. It's believed that he was burned and dipped in hot oil as they tried to kill him for his faith. And yet he survived. So he's probably in excruciating pain with scars, writing on this island at the end of his years, and he gets a revelation. And seven different churches, as we talked about in the first week, Jesus walks amongst the seven lampstands, it says, revealing that he's walking amongst seven different churches. Each church has a different message. And last week, Dwayne preached about the church of Ephesus and how they lost their first love. They were doing so many things right, but they became complacent in their faith. They no longer were passionate about their faith. And then he switches gears. And here's what he says to the church of Smyrna. Such a small little passage in Revelation 2 verse 8 through 11. And if you're looking for the book of Revelation, it's the last book of your Bible. And just turn to chapter 2, verse 8. And it says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has hears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. And so here John writes to the people, the church of Smyrna, and we don't know very much about this church. All we know, because it wasn't even written in the book of Acts along Paul's missionary journeys, all we know is that this city worshipped a lot of pagan gods. 
It was often believed that this, this city would, would have a, a road of gold around it as, as a crown of gold around someone's head. And amongst this road, as they traveled along, they would often come from deity to deity to deity, statue to statue to statue, where they had opportunities to worship these pagan gods. This last summer, me and my wife took our family to Washington, D.C., and there's a four-mile walk along the monuments where these different things had happened in history, these different events, and they had created uh, several different monuments that you can visit to actually celebrate different events. Picture it like that. They have this golden road as you just travel all around the city, and you can just worship all of these different deities. The deity of Zeus, the Greek god. The deity of Aphrodite the goddess of procreation. All of these different deities. And the Christians within there. There's a small church that came and rose up. The Christians who had faith. The Christians now as they're continuing to worship God. They weren't even considered Christian back then because they didn't have the name of Christ because Christianity was illegal. So for 312 years... After Jesus died, Christians would be killed for their faith. Christians would be persecuted. Christians would be crucified on crosses, just as Jesus was, where it was believed that Peter, on the day of his crucifixion, said, you know what, I can't be crucified like my Lord and Savior. Can you please crucify me upside down? And they did. And he died upside down on a cross, where people were burned, where people were fed in the lion's dead, and the Roman Emperor Caesar enjoyed at the games seeing Christians where they would bet, how long can this person survive against this lion? And they would take bets on how long until the lion actually mauled the Christian. And so you have all of these events happening. And here, John on this island is going, where's Jesus in this? Much like Charles Templeton, when he looked at this picture of this starving African child, said, how can a loving God allow this to happen? And then John gets a little bit of motivation. And he begins to write about some of the sufferings that are taking place. And he says, these are the words of him who is first and last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty yet you are rich. And what he's saying is the Christians in that area, the very first thing that they would suffer is going to be poverty. They're going, to, they're going to go through some hard times. Because of their faith, they might actually lose their jobs. Because of their faith, they might actually lose their source of income. You see, if their boss found out they were Christian, then they would cast them out and say, absolutely not. You have no more opportunity to work. And so what he's writing here is that your faith might actually cost you something. A lot of people believe today and just wonder, why does God allow things to happen? Once I start to follow after him, once I know Jesus, isn't everything going to be all right? Isn't everything going to get better? Shouldn't I make more money because now that I believe that God provides, shouldn't he give me more? Shouldn't God allow my family to be blessed? Why is it that sometimes I can't I'll do this? My family's fighting. The relationship's hard. Why does it seem that everything's falling apart? Why is it that I can't provide for my family? In 2008, more people flocked to church because of the hard times of the economy than ever before. Once the economy starts to get good again, people leave. Why is that? Because people turn to God sometimes in the midst of problems, but forget about him when things are okay. And then sometimes in the midst of problems, they begin to question God. They show up questioning God. But the faith doesn't take root, else they would continue coming to hear about God and praise Him even when it gets better. So they're willing to show up and question God when things are bad, to hear a message for their life. Why are things so bad? And here John is writing, because we're going to suffer some persecution. Because sometimes people, even if their faith, they believe in Jesus, they're going to lose their jobs. That doesn't save you from losing your job. Sometimes because of your faith, there's going to be things happen. Families can't have children. Well, why not? God, you open the womb of the people in the Old Testament. Why can't you open my wife's? And we begin to question when things don't turn out our 
way. It's common. But just as God provided back then, just as God did miracles back then, what he says is he says, listen, you might experience poverty, but yet you are very rich. You're focusing on the wrong thing here. You're focusing on all the worldly things. You're focusing on the income instead of the one that can provide the income. You're focusing on the problem instead of the problem solver. You're focusing on the situation instead of the one that can take you and provide for you and be with you and be present in the situation. You're focused on the wrong things. He says, you're going to have problems, but yet even though you have problems, you are very, very rich. Even though that you're very, very poor on this earth, you have something much more. You have a hidden treasure that nobody else knows about or recognizes. You have the potential for something great. Even though people see you as poor, you need to see yourself as rich. You need to see yourself as opposite. You have a different perspective as a believer in Jesus Christ than everyone else. Lee Strobel interviews a lady, and Lee Strobel was a Christian atheist who was trying to disprove Christianity at the time. He worked for the Chicago Tribune, and he would go around interviewing person after person after person, trying to figure out the arguments against Christianity so he could um, disprove it and write a book on it. At the end of his findings, he ends up becoming a believer in himself and actually says it's easier to believe than it is not to believe. It's a great book. It's called The Case for Christ. In that book, he's interviewing a lady who he interviews, and she goes home day after day. The, kill, the kids have very, barely anything. And as the kids are walking home from school, it's cold outside, and she, he notices that she continues to give her jacket away and freeze so the kids can share this jacket between them. Half of the way home, the kid, one kid wears the jacket. The other half of the way home, the other kid wears the jacket. They get into their house, which is just a very, very small apartment, and there's only one chair and one dining table as a piece of furniture. And they sit there on the floor and have a very small meal together. And Lee Strobel's wondering, why is it that they have such joy in their heart? I don't get this. I mean, you look at their life and their lifestyle and you would wonder, why is it that they're smiling? Why is it that they're joking on the way home? Why is it that they're hugging in the house? Why is it that they're playing together? Why is it that they're having conversations together? I see people that have so much more possessions and they seem to hate each other. They're fighting over the possessions with one another. They're fighting in families together. They own such a great big house and they're living at opposite ends in opposite rooms and they want a bigger space in order to see each other less. Why is is it that the family who has just so little is so happy and content? And the one conclusion that he could draw from was that because they had a relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship continued to provide joy in the midst of poverty. That relationship continued to provide happiness where they could enjoy each other and each other's company. And her perspective was, God's given me less, but now we have more time to enjoy with each other. I read a book, The Same Kind of Difference as Me, and in this book, there's a very, very rich man who's done very, very well as an art supplier. And he becomes to know through faith that his wife brings him to a homeless shelter and he begins to serve at. He doesn't want to serve at this homeless shelter, but he knows it's the right thing to do. He knows that Jesus loves people. So he goes along with his wife and begins to serve at this homeless shelter. And he learns about this great big African-American man that everyone is scared of. Everyone's scared of him. Now this guy is exactly opposite. Small, white, older. This guy is younger, larger, stronger. One man's rich, the other's poor. But he begins to try to have conversations with this man because he knows nobody else speaks to him. Over a time and period, this guy grunts at him and begins to say things to him and, and just kind of says, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anybody. But he noticed he comes week after week after week and has a meal. And so he just sits there and is quiet with them and has a meal. And they begin talking over and over. And they actually develop a relationship over time. 
One day the rich man pulls out his keys to hand them to his wife because she needs something and they're sitting there on the table and, and he know the, the poor man who's in the homeless shelter realizes that all of these keys on the key ring and he looks at him and he says, listen, are all those keys yours? He says, yeah, they're, they're mine. Do all those keys belong to something? Yeah, they, they belong to something. Something different? Yeah, I got a key for my house, a key for my car, a key for my boat, a key... Yeah, they, they, they belong to something. And he says, let me ask you a question. Rich man leans in and says, yeah, sure. Because not many opportunities has he heard the poor man speak. Large poor man looks at him and says, do those keys control you? Or do you control those keys? I always took that. Because sometimes the things in life can begin to control us. Our possessions, the things that we have, they control our time, they control our resources, they control our life, they control our family. And here what he's saying is even though you're very poor, you're very, very rich. Even though you have less, you have more. And some of those people that look like they have more, they have less. Because they might have more right now. But do, are they going to have more in eternity? Are they going to have salvation? Are they going to have an afterlife? Do they have joy and contentment? Or are they looking to fulfill the void in their life by filling up that void with all the things of this world? You see, it's not about the amount of things you have, is what he's saying. I'm not saying you have to sell everything and give everything to the poor, and, it, and that's what God's saying is we got to live like poor people. What I'm saying is stuff is just stuff. And some people have more of stuff, but less of God. And some people have less of stuff and more of God. And what he says, even though you're poor, you are very, very rich. Then he continues on and says, listen, some of you are going to lose your jobs. You're going to go through some financial hardships. It's not this theology that some people get that even though you believe in Jesus, nothing bad's ever going to happen. No, some things bad do happen. And we got to have faith that God's going to provide. we got to have faith that God can do all things. we got to have faith that God can provide that next job. And maybe he wants something even better for us. But he says sometimes you're going to have the perspective. You're going to have the perspective that you're very, very poor. You're going to have the perspective where you don't understand what God is doing right now at this time. You're going to have the perspective where all you can do is trust. But I'm telling you and giving you a message. Even though it seems like you're poor now. Even though it seems like you're living paycheck to paycheck. Even though you don't know how you're going to provide for your family in the future. Because you didn't have an eternal bank account. I'm telling you, you're very, very rich. Because you have a provider who cares for you. Who provides for you who sustains you in times of trouble he'll walk you through it he'll give you what you need and he turns them to the one who can actually provide for their needs not the substance not not the the creation but the creator and then he continues on and he says you're gonna suffer persecution the first one's poverty look at what he says about the second he says, I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. He says, you're going to go through people saying stuff about you. Not only are you going to hurt sometimes financially, but guess what? There's going to be some people who actually say things about you because of your faith. We just read in my small group, Acts 13 to 14, and, and here's what it says. is As Paul was traveling along, planting churches with Barnabas over and over in different cities, all he's doing is going out and preaching the gospel. Now, if you know anything about Paul's life, he used to be Saul of Tarsus. That's what they used to call him. He used to actually persecute Christians because he didn't believe in the faith called the way, the faith of Jesus. He was a devout Jew, and he believed in the Jewish faith, faith of Abraham. And so when Christians, 
Christianity came about and people started to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, he would kill them because he thought they were blaspheming the name of God because he was a very devout Jew. And he would put them to death until one day Jesus grabbed a hold of his heart and converted him and sent him out to be one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived, planting churches in the book of Acts. And so he's out there planting churches with Paul. Or Paul is planting church with the Barnabas. And they come to a city and... Next slide. It says, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. That is awesome! Paul goes in, preaches the gospel, people come forward and get saved. Jesus shows up, the Holy Spirit is there. It's a time of celebration. It's like when people come forward in our church and they accept Jesus for the first time, we clap and celebrate because we're happy. There's angels in heaven partying because people have accepted Jesus. But, the very next verse. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against their brothers. There's always going to be an individual who begins to stir things up. Whether you're at work, in your family, or even in the church, there's always an individual that can stir things up. Cancer begins with one or two cells in the entire body. It's the same thing with people who stir things up. The Jews come down here that were so zealous for Abraham's faith and rejected Christianity, and they begin to tell the people who had just accepted Jesus, these guys are liars. These guys are up to no good. These guys are in here preaching about Jesus, a foreign concept, probably because they want your money. And they're selling this, this false gospel saying, Jesus isn't the way, Abraham's the way. You need to be circumcised. You need to live for God. You need to follow all his rules and instructions. Grace doesn't exist. Mercy doesn't exist. And they begin to stir things up. And the whole city ends up turning against Paul and dragging him outside of the city. And they stone him to the point where they thought he was dead. He was bleeding if you read the passage. He was laying there. They turned around and they walked away thinking that the man is dead. Paul, when he comes to and gets back up, brushes himself off, checks his cuts, and walks right back into the city. Now, I don't know about you, but me and my faith, we would walk out of that city and somewhere else to preach the gospel. Paul says, absolutely not, walks right back into the city and preaches again. He says, you can stone me, you can kill me, you can slander me, you can ridicule me. It doesn't matter. My Jesus lived, I know it, I saw him, I'm a witness to it, and I'm going to preach it no matter what. Why would somebody choose to die for a lie if they did not believe and actually witness Jesus Christ speaking to them? You see, because people were willing to give up their own lives for somebody else to become saved. They weren't trying to save themselves. They were trying to save the people in that city. People will question all day long, is God true? Is, is God real? Can I really trust him? The truth is, I look at people over history that were willing to give up their life for somebody else. You see, other religions, they'll take lives. They might take their own, but they take lives out of anger and hatred. Christianity is so different. They gave their life up for somebody else. They became a savior to somebody else because they knew Jesus to be their own personal savior. And he says, you can slander me, you can say things about me, you can gossip about me, but it does not matter because I know the truth. In this life, you will have people that say things about you because of your faith. You will have people that criticize you. You will have people even in the church who say, and begin to judge you. And maybe some of you have had that experience. Hopefully not here. Where you've gone to church sometime. And you've heard gossip. You've heard rumors. You've heard judgment. Because the church is made up of sinners. And when sinful people come together. They often sin. But we're called to repent. We're called to do something different. We're called to live a different type of life. So maybe you've been affected negatively. From all of this slander. Where people will slander you. Maybe it's people outside the church slandering you for, what do you mean you're giving a portion of your income away to God? Are you kidding me? You need it all. 
You can afford that if you do this. You can buy this if you keep that for yourself. Maybe it's people who will sit there and slander you because you're going to willing to give up your Sunday morning to actually go to church. What do you mean you're giving up your Sunday morning? We can go to breakfast at Denny's and have pancakes and waffles. What are you doing here? Well, let's go after church. No, man, i got to eat at 9 o'clock. This is where I'm going to be at. You'll have people that criticize you because you chose to join a power group during the week. What do you mean you're giving up your night, your evening? To go and read the Bible. Are you kidding me? You'll have people in high school and middle school. For some of you in this room. Because you choose not to go with the certain in crowd or the in group. And do what they're doing. No man I don't do that. Why not? Oh, Because I believe in God and he tells us not to. Are you kidding? Are you... Take it off the shelf. Five finger discount. Dude do it. Everyone's doing it. Smoke it. Drink it. Party it. Have fun. You'll have people that will entice you and tempt you and slander you when you try to be obedient to God. That's what he's saying. Because of the slander of the Jews, my church is experiencing persecution. Remember in the city of Smyrna, they were worshiping other gods. There's Jews in that city saying, this sect, the way, this little Christian group, they're out there trying to worship God. Are you kidding me? And they began to slander them. And he says, it doesn't matter that they're slandering me. It's just something I give to God in the meantime. The third way they they were persecuted is he says, of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Notice he says what you're about to suffer. He doesn't say you might suffer. What he says is you will suffer. There is suffering in our faith. There is suffering in life. Just because we're Christian doesn't remove the suffering. In fact, James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face many trials. James doesn't say be joyful and happy and content because you're going through trials. No. What he says is be joyful, happy, and content because you have a God who goes through trials with you. I wouldn't want to face this life without having a God who can face my trials with me. That's what James is trying to get at. That's what John is saying. There is going to be suffering. Every single person has to suffer because we live in a sinful, broken world. That's the result. Why are there children starving out there? Because people don't give them food. There's more than enough food that goes around in the world to feed everybody, but it's not equally distributed. And so God says, I'm the provider. I've given you the rules to go out and share. What more can I do? Well, God, why don't you just drop something right before them? He says, why don't you go out and serve them? Why don't you go out and love them? Why don't you go out and teach them how to grow? Why don't you grow something with them? Why don't you go plant things over there? So we send missionaries as a church to show God's love. God uses us and partners with us to redeem his world. And he says, this life here, this world of in-between, it's broken. I didn't create it broken but you broke it. Well, God, how can I fix it? You can't fix it. But I can. I can begin to repair it piece by piece and person by person. And so in this life, this will be the closest to hell you'll ever get because you are in the midst of a broken picture that I'm piecing together. You're going to get involved with people who are broken. You're going to get involved with people who are messy. You're going to get involved with people who are suffering. And you can suffer with them. And you're going to hurt with them. And you're going to experience brokenness because you live in this world. But don't worry. This is the closest to hell you're ever going to get. Unfortunately, this is the closest to heaven other people are going to get. The people who live in the brokenness who don't know. So he writes to the church and he says, even though you're experiencing poverty, even though you're being slandered, even though I'm going to get you imprisoned, it's going to happen. People are going to lock you up and put you away because you're preaching a gospel that they don't want to hear. So many times, people don't want to hear the truth because then they have to stop doing what they're doing and he says listen i'm going to teach the truth you're going to go out and preach but they're going to lock you up because of it but don't worry here's what he says do not in verse 10 do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer i tell you the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days be faithful even to the point of death 
He says, be faithful. Even if they kill you, be faithful. Be obedient. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't lose sight. You see, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. If there's one thing I want you to walk away with is don't lose hope despite what anything is happening in your life. There is a God who created you, who loves you, and says, I understand what you're going through. Even though you're going through it, I understand. He begins this passage by saying, I am the first and the last. Notice the difference, the first and the last, the extreme, and you're in between. I know all things. I created all things. I created it this way, but it broke. It's not the way I created the break. I didn't create it to break, but it broke. But I'm redeeming it, and I'm the last one. I will be the last one standing. I will be the last one there. So you don't have to go through this alone. One of the first things Jesus says is, I understand I understand what you're going through. Why? Because I came to this earth and I suffered temptation and I suffered persecution and I was out in the desert fasting when Satan came and began to ridicule and tempt me. And so when Satan comes to you and begins to tempt you, I know what it's like to go through temptation. When Satan comes to you and takes away things through people and they begin to hurt you and destroy you, I know what it's like for people to take things away from me. When people persecute you and, and ridicule you and spit on you because of your faith, I know what it's like. Jesus understands because he suffered. He came as the suffering servant who willingly came to die on the cross for your sins and mine so we could be washed clean. So he says, I understand what it's like to suffer. But don't be afraid, because that's not the end of the message. The end of the message is that after the crucifixion, after Jesus was separated from God, God rose him from the dead. He lifted him up for people to see that he has risen, and people witnessed it. So they went out preaching it, which got them persecuted, but they were willing to die for their faith because they saw the risen Jesus. And it's a promise to all of us that if you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sin, just as God raised him up from the death, God will raise you up as well. So he says, in this life, you're focused on the wrong thing. You're focused on the things in this life instead of the things that yet to come. You're focused on right here, right now, instead of what's coming in the future. And he says, in order for that to switch, in order for that to change, he calls us not to be afraid. How are you not going to be afraid? By trust. By trusting God. Notice what he says here at the end of the passage. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will, put some, will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. You see, he tries to tell people, I'm the beginning and the last. I know what you're going through. I've been here the entire time. I haven't abandoned my creation. You broke it. But I didn't just say, okay, just let it go. No, I began to pick it up and piece it back, piece by piece by piece, just like I can do in your life. You've broken some things in your life. You've hurt some relationships. You've hurt some people. You've hurt who you are. But I can make you a new creation. I can restore it. I can bring it back to life. I'm the beginning and the last. And I won't leave until you're fully restored. I won't quit until you're pieced all back together as long as you give me your life. He says, don't be afraid. So many times we focus on the future. Things that even haven't happened yet. And we get scared. We're like, what happens if I get sick? What happens if, if this happens? And, and we, we work ourselves so far up that we worry. We worry about things that even haven't happened yet. And he's saying, why are you worried? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6. As he's talking to his disciples, the very last passage there, Eric, that I have on there, Matthew 6. And he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Don't pursue the stuff. Pursue the one that can give you the stuff. Don't pursue a lifestyle where there's no slander and no suffering, but give thanks to the one who can walk with you through the suffering. 
And he says, seek first his kingdom. You see, he was here first. Seek first his kingdom. He created you. He understands you. He's here with you. And he wants you to seek after him. And if you seek after him, you'll find him. And he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Every problem is an opportunity to run to God or from God. How are you going to use the problems that God gives you in your life? Are you going to take it to him and trust him that he can handle it? That he's a big enough God there for you? That he understands you? And are you going to pray it up to him? He's asking you and calling you. He says, this church is under persecution. But don't worry. These other people who are walking around this city of gold as it's a crown of gold for them. Don't worry. One day you're going to have a crown of gold as well. One day you're going to experience the victor's life. One day you're going to know the joy that I have for you. That I've intentionally given to you. you got to believe and you got to trust. Don't worry about the future. Worry about today. That's what he says. Enough days have troubles in themselves. But if you give your troubles and problems up to God, you don't have to carry them anymore. You don't have to continue trying to do life on your own. You don't have to take the weight of the entire world and put it on your shoulders as a burden to make all your decisions. You have somebody who's willing to carry you. You have somebody who's willing to walk beside you. You have somebody who's willing to take those problems off of your shoulders and put them on his own. He says, cast your burdens upon me and I will give you rest. He wants some of you to experience peace despite the problems you're going through. He wants you to experience a love that you've never experienced with anybody else before, where you have a God willing to lay down his life for you. How many of you have had someone just willingly lay down their life for them? He's here and he's present. He's laid down his life and God raised him back from the dead to show you how much he loves you and cares for you. And he says, listen, this town of Smyrna, this, this church of Smyrna, Smyrna actually means myrrh. Myrrh was a substance often in the Bible that they used to anoint people who were dead. It's what they gave Jesus when he was born as the three wise men that we celebrate at Christmas. A weird gift to give a child to celebrate his birth is an is a essence, an a aroma of death that they would rub on the bodies in order to embalm the bodies signaling and signifying as a symbol that he was going to suffer and die as well. And this town of Smyrna who's experiencing all this death and persecution, what he says is as a, a voice of encouragement, don't worry, it's not over. You're so focused on the future of what's going to happen, but focus on today, he says. But then he turns around and he says, but then don't focus on the problems in the future because there's problems today. And you got to give your trust to Jesus today. But he says, focus on the problems today, but focus on the reward in the future. You see how he turns that around? He does something awesome in this letter. He says, listen, there are so many problems. You're going to work yourself so far up anxiety and stress because you're focused on things that haven't even come yet. Let those go to know that you have a God in control and he's with you and he wants to walk with you in every single problem today. Just focus on today because today has enough stress in itself and give those to God. Practice today right now giving your problems and burdens up to God in prayer and he will give you rest and he will give you peace. But focus not on the solutions or I should say the rewards today because you might not be seeing them. Focus on the rewards in the future. There's going to be a crown of life placed around your head. There's going to be eternity. Do you know how long eternity is? Exactly. It's a long time. Never ending. So you might experience 30 years of problems. You might experience 60 years. You might experience 90 years. You have a loving father who's walking you through those problems. Who's giving you joy despite your problems. Who you can turn to and get peace even in the midst of it. But you're so focused on the problems that you're missing the perspective of the joy that he can bring. So he says, give him the problems. And then he flips it around and I'll say it one more time. He says, focus 
on the reward of eternal life. Focus on the reward of tomorrow. Focus on the problems of today, but focus on the reward of tomorrow of what you're going to get for walking with Jesus. It says even to the point of death. You see, so many of us right here are focused just on this part. 30, 60, 90 years, if we're lucky. And we're focused right here. We give all of our problems right here. And we just focus and we, we get so mad at God, so angry at God, we spit at God. And he says, listen, you are in a spiritual war. Don't you understand that? Don't you understand there's people going to hell right now and there's people worshiping Satan and there's people following Satan? You're either on God's team or you're on Satan's team. There's no in-between. He speaks later in the book of Revelation. He says, lukewarm water I spit out of my mouth. You either need to be hot or cold. There's only two teams. You need to join one or the other. And he says, what happens is you're focused right here when you don't even realize that you have a God of eternity who says, focus on the reward that you will get for eternity, it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Amen? We're so focused on the limited and we need to focus that there's a reward coming so greater and so beyond that you can even imagine. As you see Jesus in heaven and there is no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more brokenness. That's a place that I want to live. That's a place I want to go to. That's a place I want to celebrate in. I want to have a birthday up in heaven. I want to say thank you, Jesus, for giving us an eternity. And he says, focus on that. And it begins to remove and help you through the problems today. And the greatest thing is, they're not even your problems because he's helping you and going through the problems with you. You're not by yourself. You're not on your own. I'll give you one final story. There was a pastor in this town of Smyrna. He was 86 years old. And under that time of the Roman emperor began to persecute these Christians they captured this pastor and his name was Polycarp and you can look it up on church history and on Google and as they're bringing Polycarp to the town one of the soldiers says listen they're gonna they're gonna persecute you here man why don't why don't you just like say can, can you just say okay Caesar is God and and still practice your faith quietly like is it that big a deal now, Polycarp had had a dream that he was also laying on a pillow and that pillow was on fire, so he knew he was going to go to the stake and be burned. He got that image from God. And he turns to this soldier and says, listen, for 86 years, God hasn't let me down. For 86 years, God's been with me. How could I ever turn my back on my loving Savior, Jesus Christ? Polycarp goes into the town and they put him to the stake and as he's being burned he says you know what you guys you guys don't have to they're, they're setting the flames around his feet waiting for his body to catch fire he goes guys you don't have to tie me up you don't have to pin me down i have a peace that surpasses all understanding i have a god who is present and he's here and he's willing to go through this trial even with me up to death go ahead Take my life because it's time for me to go home and it's time for me to meet my Savior. Go for it. And as he was being burned, he had such a peace that transcended everybody's unbelief that it was said that a Roman soldier even ran him through with a knife to quit his suffering because he was so calm and peaceful as he was being burned. They didn't understand it. It's the same peace that's available to any one of us that no matter what we're going through, no matter what somebody has said about you, no matter what problem you're facing, whether it's financial, whether it's insecurity, whether it's family, whether it's with your job, whether it's with a relationship, whether it's with your spouse, it doesn't matter. Jesus is willing to be there with you to take that problem off of your shoulders. All we do is have to trust him. 
All we do is have to put our faith in Him. He is the Creator. Will you come to me in prayer, He says, and will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, You are the Creator. We are the creation. We have a limited understanding of this life and of this world. We don't know everything and why it happens. We read books in the Bible, look at like the book of Job, where it seems like people just suffer. <laughs> Yet even then, you won out. Even then, you showed that Job had faith, even though Satan didn't believe that he would. Father, we are at a spiritual war, and right now I'm calling your troops. I'm calling them forward. I'm giving a gospel account, asking them to rise up and to be a witness for you, to speak for you. Despite what any problems we have, Lord, may you give these people the strength and courage to be warriors and soldiers for your kingdom, to fight against Satan, to fight against the devil, to fight against the spiritual realm. And we can only do that through prayer. We can only do that through boldness of speaking your word. And we got to know your word to be able to speak it. And Father, I pray that you bless us with that peace that no matter what we go through, it transcends all understanding. It's a peace that we know. It's a peace that we've sometimes experienced and that's why we're here. And maybe somebody in this room has not experienced that peace. And they want it. They want it right now. So Father, as we close, not only do I ask you to encourage your people through the midst of their trials and to give them over to you, I pray that there's somebody here who needs your peace, who's willing to receive your peace, and it only happens through knowing Jesus Christ. And so, Father, will you bless an individual in here who needs to know about your son, Jesus, for them to take the steps of courage and receive that peace right now. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.